Tonight, the federal government says support for the housing crisis is there, but the capital city should be asking for more. The federal government wants the city of St. John's to up the ante when it comes to housing, according to a leaked letter from Housing Minister Sean Fraser. Let's turn it up to 11. Like we mean it. We really, we really are focused on this and we want to be ambitious. I'll have more on that story coming up on Here and Now. In less than 24 hours, the Conservative Party in this province is going to have a new leader. I'm live at the convention and I'll break down who's running and what's at stake coming up. Senior hockey shakeup. Some teams are in, some teams are out. I'm really disappointed with, with the, uh, the way this took place. I'm Alex Kennedy and we'll break down the complicated nature of senior hockey in Newfoundland coming up. Well, the lights are on, the drummers are drumming, and the players have just hit the field. It's Friday Night Lights Football in Paradise. I'll tell you all about it. Coming up. This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. The federal government is calling on the city of St. John's to be more ambitious in its plans to tackle the housing crisis. But one housing researcher and former city councillor says municipalities can't shoulder the problem alone. Here and Now's Heather Gillis has our top story. It's not hard to see signs the province is in the grips of a housing crisis. People have been protesting here at this encampment on the lawn of the Confederation Building for almost two straight weeks. When it comes to housing, Ottawa says St. John's is falling short. CBC News has obtained a letter from the federal housing minister to St. John's Mayor Danny Breen. Sean Fraser writes the city could have asked for more from the $4 billion housing accelerator fund. Last week, Fraser wrote, the city applied for only $2 million, reflecting a desire to build only 91 additional units. Seamus O'Regan says housing is a top priority and the time to act is now. We can find an arrangement here with the city of St. John's to make sure that we can help them as, as best as we possibly can. And we want to work with them directly. So we're just saying, let's, let's ramp it up. Let's turn it up to 11. The federal government, O'Regan says, just signed a deal with Halifax to build 10,000 homes over the next 10 years and wants something similar here. We're putting the money up in other cities. We're signing deals with other cities. We're just saying, look, be more ambitious. Give us a more ambitious plan. You'll be surprised how far we may be willing to go to help you get there. Ottawa also offered some advice on how the city can help create more housing. Making it so that, you know, four units on a property is not something that is special, but we can do automatically. Making sure that the permitting system is electronic. Uh, looking at greater densification around the university and around the downtown. Uh, and really targeting grants at affordable housing. In a statement, the City of St. John says it's not in a position to comment on the letter from the feds. However, they do say they appreciate the feedback. The city says it will try to strengthen its proposal and respond to the recommendations. Meanwhile, this housing researcher and former city councillor says municipalities often have limited capacity to deal with housing issues, but doesn't believe Ottawa has acted quickly enough. And I don't know that them going to municipalities who are significantly less resourced than they are and making it their job and their responsibility is necessarily the, the way to go. Meanwhile, O'Regan says the federal government is willing to offer tailored solutions to help with housing. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. A 38-year-old New Brunswick man has died in what police are calling an industrial accident at a Tata Steel mine site in northern Labrador. The RNC says the company notified them of the death just before 2 p.m. yesterday. Both the RNC and Quebec police responded. Tata Steel runs an iron ore mining operation near Shefferville, Shefferville. Occupational Health and Safety and the Chief Medical Examiner's Office are involved in the investigation. Well, Nova Scotia is formally abandoning the Atlantic Loop, and New Brunswick's premier says he's unsure about the project. The plan would see the construction of a transmission line corridor in Atlantic Canada to transport electricity to other markets. But even with one province out and one in doubt, Labour Minister Seamus O'Regan says the loop could still happen. You know, deals are always ready to be made. Things go up, things go down. Um, 
But uh, look, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't care how we get there, really, so much as we get there. Um, and, and getting there means getting Nova Scotia and New Brunswick off a of coal. I still think that the Atlantic Loop is, is an excellent idea, but everybody's got to be on board with it. The provinces have to feel not only comfortable with it, but they have to be complete partners in it. If they're not there yet, then let's look at other ways in which to do this. Well, a new leader of the PC party will be decided in less than 24 hours from now. Three men are vying to replace Chess Crosby, who stepped down more than two years ago. The convention is underway in St. John's, and that's where here and now's Peter Cowan is tonight. So, Peter, what's happening there? Well, Carolyn, the convention is just getting underway. There are conservatives who've gathered here from all the parts of the province, but much of the decision making on who the next leader is going to be has actually already been made. I'll explain that in a second, but first, let's just kind of recap who the three choices are that the party has to choose from. Starting with uh, Lloyd Parrott, he was the first to get into the race more than a year ago. He's been an MHA since 2019 and is a former Canadian Armed Forces member. Then there's Tony Wakeham, who you may remember ran last time against Chester. Crosby and came in second. Since then, he's been elected to the House of Assembly, and as well as his love of basketball, he's also a former health care executive in this province. And the third candidate is Eugene Manning, uh, who may not be a well-known name in politics publicly, but behind the scenes here at the party, he's very well known for the work he's done getting other candidates elected. He's bringing his small business experience to this race. So those are the three candidates. Let's take a look at how some of the numbers break down and how the new leader is going to be chosen with a few of the numbers. So starting one of the key numbers, uh, more than 10,000. That's how many people signed up to be a supporter of the PC party. They're the ones who get to make that choice between these three people. Uh, most of that voting has already been done online because, in fact, as of this morning, 87% of the eligible candidates had all cast their ballot. Uh, so a few may, you know, wait for some speeches tomorrow afternoon, but most of that's already been locked in. So the way it's going to work, though, is it's not just about signing up the most members total. It's also about where they are in the province, because each of the 40 individual districts all has the same weighting. So over the last year, the candidates have gotten out, signed up people in all parts of the province, and the party is hoping that gives them an edge going into the next election. The real success in this for any candidate is going to be how many supporters they were able to sign up in each one of the districts. So making sure that support is well spread out throughout the province has been uh, crucial to the candidates as they move into this uh, this voting period. So uh, we're happy to say that you know we have great representation across all 40 districts here in the province, and we'll have those uh, those supporters signed up and and identified for the next election as well. Now, tomorrow night, of course, is going to be all about choosing the new leader, but tonight it's about saying goodbye to the one who's stepping out of the role. David Brazel filled in in a temporary basis now for more than two years. Uh, this is going to be a chance for a little bit of a tribute to him and his chance to give one last speech as leader before he hands it over to someone new tomorrow. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. Well, I know we're only a few weeks into fall, but I'm sure some of you, especially if you're snow lovers, are uh, looking forward to what the winter has in uh, <laughs> what the winter has in store. Well, a early season uh, snowfall anomaly forecast was uh, released today and as you can see these purples here are above uh, or sorry below what you would typically see in a year. And if I zoom into Newfoundland Labrador you can see most of the island and southeastern portions of the uh, of the coast of Labrador are below normal or expected to be below normal where most of Labrador is in that above normal. So that means you're going to see more snowfall. Now why is this? Well there's a good indication that we're going to see an El Nino winter. And when that happens, we've got cold air to the north. The jet stream, the polar jet stream, typically moves a little bit north and pretty much heads right between Newfoundland and Labrador. So what that means is we're going to see particularly snowy conditions to the north of that and then to the south of the track of the area of low pressure, we typically see a lot more mixing. So that means freezing rain, rain, and even the potential for some ice pellets. So that doesn't mean we're not going to see snow at all. We certainly will, but uh, it does look like we're going to see a little bit warmer than normal. So I get into the forecast, our forecast, there's a lot of rain in it coming up.
Thanks, Ashley. Well, the provincial government is condemning any acts of hate or violence. In a statement this afternoon, it says some people are feeling unsafe and vulnerable as a result of the ongoing crisis in Israel, the West Bank and Gaza. The statement reads in part, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia will not be tolerated. Newfoundland and Labrador is a safe and welcoming province and goes on to say the unspeakable acts that the terrorist organization Hamas has carried out cannot be tolerated. We stand with the government of Canada in condemning acts of terror and call on all parties to abide by the requirements of international law. Well, the RCMP is urging anyone who feels threatened, whether that be online or in person, to contact provincial police. The RNC increased its police presence near a St. John's mosque as well as a synagogue today. This after community leaders expressed safety concerns. The SPCA in Cornerbrook is having a tough time keeping up with demand for animal housing. The shelter was recently overwhelmed with an influx of animals. Right now they're in a temporary shelter, but they can't stay there much longer and the SPCA doesn't know where to put them. CBC's James Grudick reports. Normally the NL West SPCA keeps all of their animals here at their shelter on Lundrigan Drive in Cornerbrook. But this shelter was already nearly full early last week when the SPCA came into custody of over 30 new animals by surprise. These are just some of the cats rescuers found in that house. SPCA President Francis Drover says some of them needed urgent veterinary care. Smaller animals like guinea pigs and rabbits were there too. Those were sent off to a small animal rescue in Grand Falls, Windsor. The RNC seized the animals on October 1st after a report of animal hoarding at a home in the city. Cornerbrook's bylaws limit the number of pets you can own to five animals per person. The SPCA needs a place to keep these animals while they try and rehome them. So the city of Cornerbrook offered up this building on Wellington Street for the time being. It's normally used as a storage garage. The city only offered up the building temporarily, so the SPCA are scrambling to find a long-term place. Francis Drover says the animals aren't ready for rehoming yet, not until their medical needs are taken care of. That could be weeks or months, so they need a place to stay for the long term, but the SPCA doesn't yet know where that will be. James Grudich, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Market volatility, unscheduled maintenance, raging forest fires. These are just some of the reasons Tecora Resources says it wanted creditor protection. That's according to court filings the company made earlier this week. The CBC's Elizabeth Witten reports. In its court filings, Tecora says it needed breathing room to figure out its financial future. It says production levels at the Scully Mine site are low, and that means higher operating costs. In 2022, the company wrapped up three projects meant to increase production, but the company says there were design problems, leading to unscheduled downtime and lower production. On top of that, the price of iron ore has been rocky. Then in June, wildfires in Quebec temporarily shut down the railway, the only way to get their product to market. Meanwhile, the company says work continues. They have a $75 million deal to cover costs for the next 20 weeks, and they don't anticipate any layoffs or benefit impacts. Wabush Mayor Ron Barron is hopeful that Decorah is committed to sticking around. It's a dark cloud that's uh, over the community. Uh, you know, moving forward, they're, they're operating. Um, so let's wait and see what's going to play out here. You know, at the end of the day, hopefully it's successful and everybody is going to be... Uh, you know, uh, moving forward and for the future. Uh, but we also had to be leery at the end of the day that that's not going to be there. Just last month, Decorah and the town signed a five-year, $12.2 million grant in lieu of taxes agreement. Barron says the future of that agreement is up in the air. The company also received $1.25 million from ACOA in June. ACOA says they're monitoring the situation, but Decorah are still in good standing. Elizabeth Witten, CBC News, St. John's. The senior hockey season in western Newfoundland is in chaos. Some teams have players but no league. Other teams have a league but are missing players. All this about a month before the season starts. Here now is Alex Kennedy reports. The Cornerbrook Civic Centre is quiet today. 
but come November 3rd, fans will crowd in for the start of senior hockey. That's when the new Cornerbrook Royals will take to the ice in the new Central West Senior Hockey League. But why new? It's a bit complicated, so lace up your skates and try to stay with me. That's because last season, the old Royals played in the West Coast Senior Hockey League, alongside Portabasque and Deer Lake. This season, Deer Lake pulled out of that league, leaving only two teams. Deer Lake then formed a league with Stephenville and Grand Falls Windsor, and along the way, a new Cornerbrook team was formed. We wanted to get to the bottom of what team is where and how the season will play out, but that's been a challenge because no one from the new Royals will talk to us about it. But they did post on social media, saying, quote, Under the leadership of a newly appointed executive and coaching staff, the Cornerbrook Royals are positioned to make a lasting impact in the Central West Senior Hockey League. No one from the Stephenville Lightning would talk to us either. We were scheduled to speak with someone from the Deer Lake Red Wings, but the league canceled that interview because they said there might be new developments this weekend. One team that is talking is the old Royals, who say the whole situation doesn't sit well with them. I'm really disappointed with, with the, uh, the way this took place because uh, uh, the executive of the uh, West Coast Senior Hockey League felt that we were headed for a three-team league and it'd be just dropped on us. So I think there's a lot of backdoor work done and that shouldn't happen. Buckle says this all started when the Western League wouldn't let Stephenville join. He feels the new league will hurt hockey on the West Coast. I uh, just want senior hockey. I want fans to be able to go up to the Cornbrook Civic Center or uh, out in Portabas or Deer Lake or whatever, whenever we expanded the team, go up there and not be, not be sure who's going to win that night. Hockey NL has approved the new Central West Senior Hockey League. The old West Coast League has yet to be renewed since three teams are required, but Tony Buckle is confident that will happen. The old players on the Royals are still left in limbo as their rights are owned by the old team until mid-November. Alex Kennedy, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, staying with sports, they call it Friday Night Lights for a reason, but for many in this province, Friday Night Football is a fairly new event. Avalon Minor Football is trying to change that, though, with a few games of tackle football underway this evening in Paradise, and that's where Jeremy Eaton is right now. So, Jeremy, how's the action on the field? Tell you one thing, it's pretty cold, Carolyn. Uh, it's a bit of Rangers and fogged here, but it is paradise. And I gotta say, I haven't been on a football field in a long, long time, but it is really beautiful. Despite the weather, the lights are out, the drums are drumming, the players are playing. We're all having a pretty good time. This is Avalon Minor football. It's tackle football. The teams on the field here now are the under 15 squads. The under 18 crowd are gonna play later. Now, they're all a little bit busy playing football, but we did manage to find uh, some players who, uh, due to uh, reasons, aren't playing tonight. So, uh, do you just want to introduce yourself real quick? My name's Leland. Yeah. I'm not playing football tonight because I got a hurt back. Did you hurt your back playing football? No. No, no, it's all good. And what's your name, man? My name's Jack Fady. And how come you're not playing tonight, Jack? I had a dirt bug accident Monday. So both of you got injured doing other things and you're not able to play football tonight, eh? Yeah. yeah. So not a lot of people get the chance to play football. So what is it about football that you like so much? I like tackling people. And just, <laughs> yeah. What about you, Jack? What's your favorite part about playing football? I like it all, most importantly, is the people that play. So I understand you're part of the under 15 crews. So these two teams practice together, the Pirates in the black and the Bucks in the red? Yeah, that's right. And you all pretty friendly off the field and on the field? Oh, yes. And I understand not a lot of people my age growing up, we always wanted to get to play football. Never got the chance. You have the chance. When did you both start playing the sport? When did you start playing? I started playing this year. And you? I just started playing last year. And uh, is this sort of something that you think you'll keep on doing for going forward? 100%. Yeah. Let's just say there's a young fella, a young boy or young girl or young folks out there about your age who want to try it but they're a little bit afraid to try it. Uh, what advice would you give them or what would you say to them? Just be yourself, go and tap on. What about you, Jack? Got any words of wisdom? I'd say try it out. I'm sure you like it. Well, you heard it here from the fellas. They've tried it out. They seem to like it. The players on the field seem to like it. Uh, we're going to talk more uh, with the president of the Avalon Minor Football uh, group so we can learn more about the sport and how they hope to grow it. 
Reporting live for here now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in Paradise. A feel-good moment to share with you now. That's Paul Cook of Happy Valley Goose Bay completing the Trap Line Marathon. Paul was told he may never walk again following a spinal surgery. Well, not so. He says he couldn't have done it without a little help from his friends at the fire department who flanked him at either side as he crossed the finish line last weekend. Congratulations. You're talking Newfoundland, right? No. And not a lot of people know what happened up here. A new opera, years in the making, dives into the story of the Ocean Ranger disaster. More about the show that premieres tonight, just ahead. Well, it is going to be a wet and windy start to the weekend. It will dry out for some of us, though. I'll get into all the details when I come back.
Well, Ashley, uh, the weekend's here. Uh, looking forward to hearing the forecast for this weekend. It's been pretty consistent in the weather. It seems like every day has been kind of the same, yeah, it at least in our neck of the woods. It absolutely has. And uh, the reason for that is we were talking about this blocking pattern or this uh, essentially stagnant pattern that we've been seeing where we're seeing all of this easterly flow. But that is about to change this weekend. <laughs> Not for good, though. We are looking at more rain on the way. We've got this area of low pressure. It has been very slow moving, but it is full of moisture and it is going to bring lots of rain with it, especially uh, starting tonight already seeing some of that rain uh, out there. Some periods that are a little bit heavy at times. Uh, you can see that swath already starting to, to develop pretty much from the Buren Peninsula all through uh, the interior and then towards uh, the coastal areas of uh, the West Coast anyway at this point. So this is going to continue as we head through the night tonight. This easterly flow also leading to some pretty dense fog out there. The airport in St. John's reporting about 0.4 kilometer visibility, so very little visibility. Uh, then up as you head towards uh, Bonavista, we're seeing similar visibility and then uh, St. Anthony a lower visibility as well, about six kilometers at the moment. Take a live look outside. We can still use this for a couple more days probably as we are starting to lose that daylight. Uh, but yes, it's very foggy out there. Our temperatures are down to uh, about 10 degrees at the moment. That rain being reported. And right now we've got those southeasterly winds around 24 kilometers per hour here in St. John's anyway. As we head through tonight and into tomorrow, those winds are going to ramp up. Current temperatures across the board pretty much where they have been for the last little bit. Anywhere from 10 to about 14 degrees across the island. Labrador, you're sitting in the single digits and that will be the story pretty much through the weekend uh, as we don't really see too much in the way of change. So here's your future tracker. Like I said, we're already starting to see those periods of rain. This will continue through the night, spread a little bit further north. In fact, we'll start to see some showers up across Labrador as well. Uh, some of the heavier showers moving in as we head towards the early morning hours. And then it pivots a little bit because uh, it's going to start to move a little bit further west. And as it does that, it's going to bring that heavier rain towards the Avalon all along the northeast coast tomorrow afternoon and then head towards more steadier rain anyway, heading towards southeast eastern portions of Labrador and you're going to see that as you head through Saturday night and into Sunday morning. Now Saturday will feature a little bit of sunshine in some cases across the island. The the breaks will be very light or very quick in nature, I should say, uh, but you're certainly still going to see that and Sunday looks like the better day by far across the island as we start to see a little bit of clearing skies. We may see a few lingering showers, but I know the Cape to Cabot is on Sunday morning and uh, it does look like the weather will clear just in time for you and temperatures are going to stay a little cool as well, which is perfect running weather. Uh, but for those of you in Labrador, you're going to hang on to the rainy conditions and that will be the story pretty much uh, as we even head into Monday as well. Another round of uh, rain is going to move in, especially across the island. Rainfall warning in place along the south coast of the island through the interior, including Green Bay, White Bay at this point. And if we take a look at the rainfall total, still indicating that the heaviest rain will fall from the Conagra to Buren Peninsula. As we're talking 70 to 100 plus millimeters of rain. Again, the heaviest rainfall we'll see maybe a bit more than that. Uh, but a large swath of between 30 to 50, even 50 plus millimeters is certainly possible. And this is just from this system. System. As we head into Monday, we're going to see that other round moving in as well. Now areas along the strait for southeastern portions of Labrador, you're also going to be in that 30 to 50 millimeter range. Uh, and then as far as central Labrador is concerned, around Happy Valley Goose Bay, you'll likely see some pockets of 30 to 50 millimeters as well. Winds will also ramp up, especially tonight and into tomorrow. Those winds gusting east or southeasterly winds uh, somewhere between 60 to 80 kilometers per hour. That will continue for the northern peninsula into your Saturday as well. Now, as far as your temperatures are concerned for tomorrow, pretty much status quo, not moving too much, maybe a bit warmer towards uh, the west coast, but 13 to 15 degrees, uh, but overall it will stay uh, fairly mild, relatively speaking anyway. And then across Labrador, you're looking at your single digit temperatures uh, for those of you towards the coast. And then in Lab West, you're staying in those single digit temperatures as well.
Okay, mental note, plan outdoor activities for Sunday if you're in the east or on the Exactly. Island. All right, thanks, <laughs> Ashley. We'll check in with you later in the show. A new opera based on Lisa Moore's 2009 novel February opens tonight. The opera on the Avalon production is a love story set against the Ocean Ranger disaster. It's been more than two years in the making. Here's a sneak peek. To make a difference with my work. You're talking Newfoundland, right? Greenest oil on the planet. Not true. Greenest. No. Being able to share this story with the world, um, speaking to a few of my American friends, not a lot of people know what happened up here. And to have that conversation and enlighten them, and then you find out, oh, these things have happened a lot more often than we would like them to. And to tell this story on such a big scale could hopefully serve as a cautionary tale that we could eliminate it, or at least limit it as much as we can in the future. What I love about it is you see this character in all stages of her life, and she's you know, thrown into a world that is tragic, but she is kind of like the beacon of, of hope and light um, for John specifically. And I just really love the transformation that she has, but also that she shares with uh, John O'Mara. The character I play is Helen O'Mara. She's a young bride. She's pregnant when she gets married, um, but this is a really true love story for, the, for um, Helen and her husband, Cal. Cal finds out that he's got a job on the Ocean Ranger and they are ecstatic, and she's pregnant with her fourth child. Um, and uh, then we, we fast forward about 19 years um, after uh, the death of uh, her husband, Cal, on the Ocean Ranger. And uh, she is, we, she's stuck. She's stuck in this kind of dark grief. I've been alone. I've been alone. I play the role of Barry, who is the love interest of Helen later in the show. Um, there's been a lot of developments over the course of the show. A lot of time has spanned. And uh, we meet Barry when Helen has decided that she wants to do some construction work renovation work on her home. Uh, it's a big metaphor for letting the light in figuratively and also literally. She wants more light in her dark space, but she wants to let some light into her world. It's a heavy story and um, I'm so honored to be doing this. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm tearing up, but it really is, uh, I'm so um, aware of the, the import of this story for this region. And uh, I, I, respect, <laughs> I respect the character for her strength and the region for its strength and all the stories that um, follow hers that are similar and, and all the people that are touched by this, by this um, very, very difficult tragedy that they've all had to experience. Not only do we want to recover the industry before the pandemic, but we want to grow the industry. Ministers from coast to coast are in the province this week talking tourism. My conversation with the federal tourism minister is just ahead.
Well, tourism is a billion dollar industry in this province and it's the focus of meetings this week in St. John's. Tourism ministers from all of the provinces and territories are here to talk about how to grow the tourism industry across the country. And so is the new federal tourism minister, Soraya martinez Ferrada, joins me now. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here and talk to you about the tourism. And what's on the agenda? What's being discussed this week about tourism? Well, I think the main thing is not only do we want to recover the industry before the pandemic, but we want to grow the industry. What was the intention before the pandemic? We were in a really good, uh, you know, growth uh, strategy uh, path. And I think right now it's not only we want to recover that, we want to grow that industry. And it's a very important industry for Canada. I mean, every province in Canada has so many things they want to show and uh, one out of ten jobs is tourism so we have challenges and uh, that's what the, you know the discussion uh, has been in a very constructive discussion actually and I guess one of the challenges is inflation for example the cost of living people don't have as much disposable income maybe to take uh, trips and to visit different places is that part of your discussion well I think it's part of the discussions in every you know, piece of society right now. Inflation and cost of living is very hard for everyone in every industry, for sure. But I think mostly the challenges for the industry to grow are a couple of things. Transport is one of them. We've talked about transport, not only how do you develop the domestic transport, but how do you get people from abroad to come to the country? That's, you know, it's the one of the first export revenues is tourism. And we have to remember that. So transport is one of them. The other one is workforce. I mean, labor shortage, it's something that really impacts uh, the industry. We want to make sure that the youth, which is a big part of our industry, sees not only tourism as a summer job, but as a lifetime job. So it's a career path, and I think there's work to be done in the workforce. And the other thing, it's the housing. Housing, you need to you know, accommodate tourism, but you need to accommodate people that are working in the tourism sector. So those are the challenges that we've been, we've been talking about. Transportation is a huge one for us being an island and uh, we have limited options when it comes to flights, particularly international flights. Is that something that's being talked about, perhaps ways to 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 increase the number of flights? Oh, absolutely. I think it's a challenge not only, yes, Newfoundland and Labrador has, but a lot of remote and rural regions in Canada. How do you get to Yukon? How do you get to the net, uh, North Territories? So it is a huge challenge. And it's a huge challenge when you develop regions that are, to your words, remote or an island. So yes, there are need to be conversations, not only with you know airlines, but also ground transportation. How do you, if you want to grow your domestic uh, tourism sector, you need to get people in Canada, within Canada. So that is a challenge. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk more about that and make sure that everybody's at the table to have the discussion because everybody wants to grow the industry. It's a, it's, it's a huge economic driver for many places in Canada. What's the role of the federal government in that? What can the federal government do uh, to help support or improve transportation? Well, I mean, there's, there's many things, right? We, we maybe don't think about these things, but for instance, a pilot license. We need to have more pilots. We need to have more students that want to be pilots because that's one of the issues that, you know, as a transport minister, he can have he can have a voice to that. As a tourism minister, I get to get all my ministers, colleagues to talk about tourism. And that's my role to advocate for that sec for the industry in the sector. And I think, yeah, transport is one of them. But I mean, working with provinces, um, you know, supporting them on building capacity for making sure that we have the restaurants and we have the food industry and accommodation to support that, supporting small businesses in that way, to agencies from the Canada development agencies. So there's many ways that, you know, I think the federal government can support the, the, the industry. Standing under the bright lights here in paradise for a little Friday night football. We're going to talk with the Avalon Monarch Football Group coming up after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm Jeremy Eaton here in Paradise on the football field, and you just missed it. Uh, one of the uh, the Pirates uh, players just scored a touchdown here. It's Friday Night Lights football here in Paradise, and here to talk a little bit about it is uh, Brian Critch from the Avalon Minor Football Group. Brian, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Brian, tell us about what's happening on the field here behind us. So this is our Friday Night Lights event. Um, this is our biggest event of the season. Uh, it's our fundraiser. We um, we have a great bit of fun. We have um, cheerleaders, we have drumline, we have great football, and uh, we have Ziggy Peel Goods over here. So, you know, we're we're having a blast. How long has this been on the go? I like, cause I know that you and I met a, a couple years ago doing an event, but this has been on, this has grown a lot since we've last spoken. So how long have you been on the go here with Avalon Minor So football? we've had Avalon Minor Football five, six years. Uh, we had amazing membership, COVID hit, and now we're on the rise again. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization, um, you know, we're co-ed, boys and girls. We play flag in the summer, we play tackle in the fall, and uh, we have a blast. Tackle football, you don't see that very often. How has that gone over with the players and, more importantly, the parents? Well, you hear stereotypes all the time. Um, injuries are nil. Uh, we try and keep everything, uh, you know, professional. Every person is trained here. We do safe contact. All of our coaches are fully trained. Um, you know, making ethical decisions. All the uh, all the training programs that we uh, we have are provided by Football Newfoundland and Labrador through Sport and L, and uh, you know, great bunch. Looking out at the field, uh, football is like hockey is pretty expensive. So uh, where do they get all the gear? So Avalon Minor Football, we supply all the equipment, 100%. Uh, um, we operate on kids memberships. Uh, we'd love to have more corporate sponsorships. Obviously, COVID slowed that down, and uh, and volunteers. Um, we supply everything 100%. Um, basically, equipment costs around $1,500 per child. Whoa. Every helmet's about 800 bucks now, all these Speedflex helmets and stuff we're wearing. Um, we provide everything 100%, and, um, and yeah, we operate about 498 uh, per season. So we pay off a set of equipment every two years. You and I were chatting earlier today and earlier this evening here. You. Uh, you got helmets, you got players, but you need a little bit more help. What do you What do you need here to grow this a little um, bit more? Volunteers are detrimental. They're terrified. We find our volunteers are scared to volunteer because of uh, stereotypical reasons of not knowing anything about football. We don't need anybody to know anything about football. We need people to help us organize personnel. Um, football knowledge, we have plenty of football knowledge, so please feel free to help. What's your favorite part about, uh, you and I were chatting earlier, but what's your favorite part about what's happening on the field here behind you, buddy? I never miss a Saturday. I would love to sit down. I would rather watch these kids play football than I would the NFL. Um, to watch these kids develop into, um, at the start of the season to the end of the season, is like night and day. They, they have a blast. Boys and girls, I've noticed the girls are even meaner than the boys, you know? <laughs> Well, I appreciate, I appreciate the invite, and I appreciate you chatting to us. This is Brian Critch from uh, Avalon Minor Football. And uh, Carolyn, I'm Jeremy Eaton, and i got to say, it is, it's always like magical out here. Would you agree? It is a blast. I can't say thank you enough for coming along. Perfect. Thank it you so much like for having us. Uh, Carolyn? Looks like a lot of fun out there, uh, Jeremy. And so nice to see that they are providing the gear for the players. That's that's pretty cool. And I'm a huge fan of TV sports movies and TV shows. Uh, so maybe there'll be some drama on the field tonight. Well, I was saying, uh, jokingly saying to Brian earlier, I feel like I'm in like a 90s teen movie. It's uh, it's a dream creature. Always wanted to play football growing up. Never got the chance. Maybe these uh, the under 18s let me slide in there, even though I'm like, three times as old. Anyways, <laughs> I think they'll let you in. They seem pretty welcoming. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jeremy. I think so. Anyways, I'll get it back to you. Take it easy. You too. Well, switching gears now, a mass exodus of Palestinians from northern Gaza is underway after orders by the Israeli military for nearly one million people to leave the area. It comes ahead of an expected ground invasion by Israel. Hamas is telling people to stay put. Meantime, Israel continues to pound southern Gaza with airstrikes. 
Retaliatory airstrikes out of Israel again today after the deadly surprise assault by Hamas on Israel last Saturday. The attack killed more than 1,300 people in Israel. Authorities in Gaza say the number of dead has climbed to 1,800. And more than 400,000 residents of Gaza have now been forced from their homes. The humanitarian situation on the ground in Gaza is worsening under a total Israeli siege. There's no electricity and a shortage of food, fuel, and medical supplies. Well, it's Friday, so let's find out who's celebrating. Happy 59th anniversary to Ben Field and Eva Fudge of Ramia, now living in Milltown. Anniversary wishes going out to Russ and Laverne Langdon of Corner Brook, who are celebrating 55 years together. Happy anniversary to Esau and Ruby Comden from Birchie Bay, who are also marking 55 years of marriage. Happy 53rd anniversary to Margie and Brian Payne, love from family and friends. Congratulations.
congratulations to Ray and Jen White of Badger. They're celebrating 57 years of marriage. Happy 61st anniversary to Linda and Wilson Hurley of Grand Falls, Windsor. Wishing Winston and Norma Wiseman of Musgrave Town a happy 60th wedding anniversary. Fred and Violet Crane of St. John's are celebrating their 62nd anniversary today. Happy 64th anniversary to Charlie and Alma Anderson of Burgio. Best wishes to Clifford and Audrey Ryland of Lansaloo who are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. We're told that they watch every night. So nice to have you along. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Gus and Marie Nash of Point Lance. Anniversary greetings going out to Aubrey and Zeta Parsons. It's their 57th anniversary. Congratulations to Eric and Erica Taylor from Paradise who are celebrating their 62nd wedding anniversary. Now to some birthdays. Happy 90th birthday to Mary Hancock. Greetings from your family. Wishing Jane Dooley of Sweet Bay a very happy 101st birthday. She's celebrating now in Clareville. Wishing Dick Duder of Grand Falls, Windsor a very happy 90th birthday from your family and friends. Happy birthday to Joyce Holloway of Monroe who's turning 92. Happy 92nd birthday also to Ruth Maidman in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 90th birthday greetings going out to Eliza King in Torbay. She's celebrating today. Happy birthday to Melvin Grandy of Garnish, who's celebrating his 97th birthday. He's now over in Marystown. Wishing Isaac Morgan of Seal Cove a very happy 94th birthday today. Happy birthday to Don Blackmore of Gander, who's turning 98. Best wishes to Shirley Bercy on her 95th birthday. She's in St. John's and happy 92nd birthday to Henry Young of Grand Falls, Windsor. Well, it's certainly going to be a rainy Saturday, and as we head into Sunday, it does look like things will certainly improve much better than what will be the story on uh, for your Saturday anyway. So we should see some periods of sun in the mix. We may hang on to the chance of a few showers across the island as the day goes on. Now, along the uh, southeastern portion of Labrador, you're going to hang on to the rain through the day and also uh, potentially the tip of the northern peninsula as well as we see that band kind of stick around through the day on Sunday. Uh, we will likely see some more cloud cover move in though as the day goes on, especially into the evening hours. This is ahead of our next system that will move in on Monday and then bring some more rain right along with it. Temperature wise, a little cooler on Sunday, just by a degree or two, but we're looking at temperatures anywhere from 10 to 15 degrees across the island. Uh, along the street, you're going to hang on to the double digits just barely. Otherwise, the rest of the big land will hang in the uh, mid to upper single digits uh, through the day. Now, like I said, into Sunday evening and into Monday, another area of low pressure develops. This one is again going to bring some heavy rain right along with it. Most of the island will see that, uh, but it'll be more of a northerly flow, so much cooler temperatures to contend with as we head through our Monday. And look at the forecast up across Labrador. We're starting to sneak in that snow chance, the snow potential as the temperatures really start to dip. Uh, through your Monday and especially into Monday evening. So uh, we're talking about daytime highs still in the single digits, but your overnight lows on Monday are going to dip across Labrador and uh, daytime highs across the island as well. Going to stay uh, into the single digits, so much cooler than it has been for the last little bit for sure, uh, but also some windy conditions will stick around, especially for the northern peninsula uh, for your Monday. Now the long range forecast keeping with that trend where we see those cooler temperatures down to the single digits for Tuesday and Wednesday. So that wet cold rain uh, will be the story by Wednesday. We'll likely see some sunshine back in the forecast. And then for central Newfoundland, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, actually not looking too bad for you. You might see a bit of a warm up, but uh, temperature really starting to dip in the overnight periods. And then for western Newfoundland, you're looking at rainy conditions right through Wednesday with some sunshine in the mix. And then for eastern Labrador after uh, Monday, actually looking like a pretty decent rest of the week uh, or beginning of the week, I should say 10 degrees by the time you get into Wednesday. And there's that flurry potential like I was talking about in Lab West with your daytime high around three degrees on your Tuesday.
Now, I didn't get to show you this photo yesterday, or at least not do it any justice, uh, but this is uh, the fog rolling through Trouty. Evelyn shared this lovely shot. I love how dramatic it is. I think it's a great photo. And uh, if you have any to share, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Just gorgeous shot. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> so the weekend's here. Hope you have a wonderful weekend, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Good night.